Hi, thanks for joining us for Your Body Advocate podcast. I'm Ruth Cummings, your host, and today I'm interviewing Christopher Henningsen. He has a new book called Health Advice for Young Dragons. He has quite an interesting past, and this is a really fun interview. So let's take a deep breath to relax. Ready? All right, here we go. You're listening to Your Body Advocate, telling your body's side of the story. The podcast dedicated to supporting and improving your body-mind connection so you can live a pain-free, passion-filled life, dissolving one body tension at a time. Discover the healing properties of your own body language, and together, let's explore ways to support and improve essential self-talk. Now, here's your host, Master of Encouragement and Body-Mind Life Coach, Ruth Cummings. Hello, everybody. Today, I have Christopher Henningsen very nearly became an alternative health practitioner, but a number of factors led him into the hard sciences instead, where he tries to reconcile the modern material worldview with the more enchanted view of reality most people actually hold. His new book, Health Advice for Young Dragons, brings together two of the interests he might have pursued full-time in another society, holistic health and poetry. Welcome, Christopher. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ruth. Yes, I love. I'm I'm so excited about your book, and also I love the name with the young dragons. Tell us about your book. Uh, thank you. So the the book is a children's book about uh, health. Um, it looks at the four pillars of health as uh, food, drink, sleep, and air. So eating, drinking, breathing, and sleeping as the, uh, the four pillars of health, which are kind of widely accepted. But it, it ties in a five elements sort of view, and it talks about play as the fifth element, as, uh, as that coming together of all the other elements and the bringing into balance. So uh, I try to make it accessible, but sort of memorable for young people. Um, but there's a bit of a pun in the title also because what's uh, how young is a young dragon? Like it's supposed to also be a good advice and just uh, good to reflect on these things also as uh, a less young human because we're still young dragons in that sense. Yes, I, are you? Um, tell me a little bit about your background because I am assuming that you are into some sort of martial arts. Is that true? Uh, yes, I, I studied a number of martial arts when I was younger, starting with uh, karate when I was seven, and I've, uh, I've just kept pursuing in, uh, in different forms since then. I, I'm not sure how you sussed that out, but uh, very astute. <laughs> I have my, my ways, yes. Um, so which, which of those did you, did you um, like the most? Like is not the word I was looking for, but which one did you like the most? Yes. Well, the first one that comes to mind is actually Aikido. But um, I think the actual answer is that a martial art depends a lot on the quality of the teacher. Um, I've, had, I've had excellent instruction in various martial arts, and I've been really drawn to martial arts, but unable to find a good teacher. Uh, so capoeira, for example, is a martial art that I really enjoy, but... Uh, haven't um, haven't found the teacher for me in that art yet. Uh, or uh, Muay Thai is, I, I actually found a teacher who's an incredibly good teacher, um, a former, former MMA fighter whom I really respect as, uh, as a martial artist, but his style was very incompatible with my own, um, I guess my own physiology. So uh, just because someone's a good teacher doesn't mean they're a good teacher for you, but uh, I would also say that if someone is a good teacher for you, uh, you can really learn a lot about any martial art from that teacher. Yes, the way you the way you move and speak just reminds me of many people I know who are very good in the martial arts. That's oh, how I you. said that right. And and then the name of your of your book, including Young Dragons, because that is something mm-hmm. that's around that culture. 
It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah now that you mention it. <laughs> so tell me more about your background. So when you say you want, you almost became an alternative health practitioner, that's interesting. And then now you're in the hard sciences. So what, what do you mean? Uh, well, when I was in high school and trying to determine my life path, uh, I sort of was facilitating between becoming a member of the Buddhist clergy uh, and practicing the, the sort of energy healing that, uh, that that comes with, or um, looking for some way to, I guess, make money, be successful. And uh, I ended up choosing the make money, be successful, which in my case, uh, I initially went into the oil industry, actually, as a, uh, as a laborer, um, and saw what our society runs on now. So then I thought, well, this this could really use some, uh, some hard science application, which uh, math and science were sort of the easier subjects for me in high school. Um, so then I, I pursued an engineering degree and uh, studied sustainable energy, um, found that that's not actually lacking for brain power, though. <laughs> um, and uh, I found my way into working in telecommunications now and uh, pursuing my, let's say, scientific or uh, engineering interests in the uh, in emerging technologies more on, on the side. What do you think that the oil industry could use? Could use? Uh, huh. A chill pill is the first, uh, the first thing that comes to mind. It's a very, um, well, put it this way. Uh, there's a lot of people nowadays uh, who have this, who hold this conspiracy theory, and I'm a fan of conspiracy theories, just not this one, that uh, there's not actually any shortage of oil, that uh, people just don't want us to have nice things. No one in the oil industry believes that. Um, anyone in the oil industry knows that this is a party that will end. Um, and they very much have this mentality of, uh, of getting as much done as possible in as short an, an amount of time as possible. And uh, I, I think that's, it's not a healthy attitude for anyone to have. And I think the way that, um, the way that we treat natural resources as kind of not belonging to anyone, um, there is, has kind of built this attitude of uh, just don't, don't think about the consequences, just be as effective in the next 30 seconds as you can be. Um, I think if there was more of a mindset of the commons um, and of things belonging to our descendants, um, I think the oil industry could have a much healthier attitude and maybe reinvest some of its profits in uh, things that will eventually make it obsolete rather than reinvesting in, um, in more of the oil and gas industry. It, in, so I'm Canadian and uh, I worked in Alberta and in Alberta in particular, it's sort of a, uh, a boom and bust cycle where when the price of oil is high, um, there's a lot of industry and a lot of profits being made, but they're only being reinvested into more oil and gas exploration and exploitation. And uh, when the price of oil goes down, then there's really very little benefit from the, uh, from the wild productivity of uh, what happened when the price of oil was high. Um, contrast that with, I mean, Norway is sort of the, the prototypical example where uh, a lot of the money made from oil and gas is explicitly invested in industries outside of oil and gas so that uh, when the, when the free energy from the oil and gas runs out, there'll be uh, investments that don't rely on that, um, that don't double down on a strategy that's uh, only temporarily effective. Wow, yes, great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a lot of time to think about it when I was, uh, <laughs> I was tripping pipe in uh, minus 20. Was it as hard as I've heard? I think if I enjoyed the culture, 
the um the, the frostbite and the the weight of things and the danger and all those things would have been exciting um for me i didn't really enjoy the culture it's a very well i don't want to say roughneck culture because uh that doesn't quite mean anything <laughs> outside of the industry but it it was a very um hard charging and aggressive culture um which just didn't jive very well so uh i i think if it was a culture that was more aligned with my interests if it was the sort of uh if it was the sort of culture where one could have interesting conversations like we're having um or where those would be easier to find uh or there was more reinvestment of the profits into something that seems sustainable um i think i might have stuck it out longer than i did but uh for me, um, what made it not worthwhile was the culture. And certainly people do wreck their bodies um, doing that kind of work. But uh, I think when you're, when you're 21 and, uh, and kind of enjoy working in minus 20 <laughs> and, uh, and, and feeling the, the effects of breathing deep in this absolutely barren wilderness, it can be fun. Um, but I, I think, think there, as in many places, the the company is what makes the difference. Yeah, very, very. That's true. I very much agree that who you have around you and who you love in your life is very rewarding. Mm. So I try to surround myself with people who love me and people who I love, and I can really, uh, yeah. I just really try to um, invest in that. Mm -hmm. so so why do you feel that it's so important to take responsibility for one's own health mm. well I, I think that health is very much an inward to outward process um, and I think because of that we can get help with our health but ultimately um, being healthy has to be a decision that everyone makes for themselves um, and understanding what healthy means in one's own context. There's this, uh, there's this saying in mental health that, uh, are you insane or are you a sane person in an insane world? Um, health doesn't always look the same to everyone, but I think uh, making the decision to be healthy or the decision to experience wellness, experience gratitude, um, or to make changes if uh, we have reasons not to be experiencing those things. Um, I think that ultimately one can be healthy in unhealthy circumstances, but one cannot be healthy if one doesn't want to be. And I think there's a lot of reasons why one might not want to be. Wow, so that really ties into what I do to advocate for one's body. So tell me why, in your opinion, would people not want to be healthy? Uh, so this actually ties into one of the questions you warned me you were going to ask, which is that uh, I think there can be there can be a an environment where one has to embody the illness of the environment in order to help it. So um, the the Jesus story um, from the Bible, I think, uh, I think encapsulates that in a very archetypal way where there's this person who uh, from themselves is not just very, very healthy and very well, but is uh, so good at um, being well that they can just tell other people to be healthy. But that person still had to sort of take on the ills of his society, um, even though if he were just living in the desert and eating wild locusts or whatever, um, he would probably outlive most people, a practitioner like that. Um, living amongst society where there was this, uh, this injustice and this enslavement and this uh, double speak, um, there was this need to take on 
the ills and to suffer for the ills of others. And I think that that um, speaks to this very core part of human nature that, uh, that there are often, there are sufferings of our fellow humans that we have to take on in a very personal way. And I think that uh, quite often we, we choose to feel the suffering of others because uh, if we don't do that, then they'll never stop suffering. Interesting. Yeah, but that begs to say that we are responsible for other people's healing and mm -hmm. they are not. So where, where is the, where's the line? Because mm. I am around that often, right? So if mm. I take on yeah. everybody's need to heal mm. and doctors do and nurses do and dentists do, mm -hmm. we would die early. Mm. And just like we were talking about today, the, mm -hmm. like I've been um, feeling burnt out. And so I'm trying to advocate for myself and advocate for mm -hmm. my body and calm it down. And um, my family knows that sitting by a river is something that is good for me. Mm -hmm. They make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can make things happen for our fellow people. Um, mm -hmm. I advocate for that for sure. Having a... Um, I talk about kindness and doing kindness for people, having a kindness challenge on my, on my newsletter every week mm -hmm. and really trying to be kind to our fellow humans. I think that helps. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it helps. I see it helping. I know it helps. Mm -hmm. So um, there is being responsible. So I agree with you. If you don't want to be better, um, mm -hmm. then it's very challenging. But if someone does, wow, we can really, really, uh, lift them up. But what do you see as the difference between those? I'm, I hear you saying just one side. That's a, that's a very interesting point. Um, I think when a society has an ill, um, we can, we tend to take that on. It tends to manifest in the individual. Um, but the, the thing that I'm maybe not so clear on is when does an ill become mine? When, does it, when, I, when do I have the right to just say, this is my sickness and I'm going to manifest health in its place? And when do we say that sickness is out there and it may be affecting me, but I can't, but I don't have the right to manifest health in that other place. And I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I have one answer for that, that I, I just, uh, I had another guest a couple of weeks ago. She had some beautiful things to say about how we make decisions sometimes based on trauma. And if mm -hmm. the trauma isn't digested and processed, then mm -hmm. our life or the person who doesn't digest that trauma, their decisions and their life is based on those decisions mm -hmm. and what would our life look like if it wasn't being run by trauma mm -hmm. and if we can digest those as individually and as a society but i think we have to start what do you think i think we have to start with ourselves the trauma that whatever trauma each one of us has been through um, to digest it so that we can then express love and kindness and compassion instead of aggression um, uh, pa uh, paranoia, um, mm -hmm. and or just running from the trauma, um, right? Right, I think or uh, hiding, hiding. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. No, no, I, I think that's I think that's an excellent point. Um, I'm also of the opinion very often that uh, once a um, once an illness is present, once it is affecting someone, then whether that's a trauma that happened to me or whether that's a trauma that happened to a lot of people um, and is now affecting me, I make a decision whether to run from the trauma or to stay with and heal the trauma and to experience that. Um, and I don't know, of course, what effect that has. Um, like say it's, say it's a trauma that didn't happen to me, but it happened to enough people that I'm experiencing the trauma of it 
I can run from that trauma. I can uh, I can believe that it uh, that it's my trauma that I'm not able to do anything about it, and that may be true. But I think if if a person, any person who's in that environment, makes the decision to stay with the trouble and to just be accepting and loving towards it. I think that that does start the healing um, and it does make it easier for everyone else to make that decision for themselves. And of course, some, some traumas are harder than others. Um, of course. When we have um, an unwellness of that nature in our lives, there are a lot of patterns that we can get uh, drawn into. Be specific, Chris. Hmm. So I think one example, um, just on a very broad context, uh, I have this theory that um, the political discourse in America is very largely a discourse about how we relate to our fathers and our mothers and that uh, a strong preference for one political party is a strong preference for a paternal or for a maternal figure in one's life. Um, and I think that the way that the conversation has gotten so acrimonious is hijacking. Um, the way the political conversation has gotten so acrimonious is actually hijacking how we relate to our own family members, our own parents, our own children. Um, the people in our lives that we see as representing a paternal or a maternal influence. So I, I would say that that's an excellent example of a uh, of an up of a pattern of unwellness that starts maybe because uh, because it's easier to make a political ad that blames someone else rather than one that takes responsibility. Um, that's a pattern that's started in a political context and has become very personal. And bring that pattern in, I have the decision, do, uh, do I hijack my internal feelings towards my parents, towards my own partner? Um, or do I, do I instead decide that 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 may be a pattern, but that I can see the pattern and I'm not going to be caught in it. And I can move in and out of it as, um, as my own instinct for rightness dictates. Oh, the instinct for rightness. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Hey, I wanted to ask you about your book. And another question we had talked about was, how do you personally integrate modern and alternative medicine? Because um, you talked about these five pillars, and I think we've touched on these already and in our conversation, but tell me more about how, do, I think that how do you personally integrate modern and alternative medicine also come about in your book? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so one thought I had on that uh, is that modern medicine is in a lot of ways, uh, if, there's a, um, if there is an embodiment of our society's ills that uh, the individuals take on and the individuals have to heal in a small scale before the, uh, before the larger scale ill can be, uh, can be healed, where that has to be modeled on an individual basis, um, then I would say that modern medicine and uh, the role that modern medicine plays in our lives is something like that. And uh, for myself, I must confess, I've, uh, I've, largely, I've largely integrated modern medicine by trying to avoid having a need for it as much as possible. <laughs> for sure the same. Hmm. But uh, I think like um, this being this being a podcast, I'm sure the, the famous podcasters like Jordan Peterson get mentioned um, and very eloquently about the values of that uh, post-war consensus 
And uh, I think it's very telling that uh, Jordan Peterson's Achilles heel was his own relation to modern medicine. Um, and I think that in, in embodying that, uh, he did kind of do what a, what a healer does because the healer is the person who was sick. Um, the, healer, the healer isn't the person who, who, who helps the person who is sick. You're, when your family is um, encouraging you to sit by a river, um, they're not the healers, you're the healer. And uh, I think that in a, in a very fundamental way, the, uh, the ills of our society may be, um, may be pointed at by modern medicine something about the, uh, the need for control, maybe. But at the same time, of course, uh, if I do have a broken arm, then I am glad to have an x-ray. Um, so it's not a, uh, it, it's not as a straightforward that uh, this is what's wrong. And uh, we need to fix it, because I think that that's sort of precisely where modern medicine is very good, but also where it becomes a little short-sighted. So yeah, when I, when I integrate the, uh, the traditional medicine and the modern medicine, I think the, the traditional or the alternative has this idea of the healer modeling the getting better for the, for the rest of the people. And I think that that's something where um, modern medicine fits in very well, because I think it is maybe a, uh, an indication of, of where our trouble is, or it can tell us something important about our trouble. Where do you think kids fall short in the five pillars of health? Uh, certainly, uh, I don't know many, um, I don't know whether you'd consider like a teenager or a kid, but I think I don't know many uh, children who play enough. Um, I don't know many adults who play enough either, but we have better excuses. You know? And really, <laughs> we also should know better, probably. But yeah, I think not enough play. Um, and I also think actually sleep quality. Um, this is just a personal theory and maybe uh, reflective of the, the circles that I run in. But um, I think a lot of young people have difficulty sleeping. Um, so I relate sleep to the fire element. And I think that uh, screens and um, the type of light we interact with is a very large part of um, what in traditional medicine would have been called the fire element. And I think that uh, if anything seems disturbed, um, that's, that seems very disturbed, particularly among young people, uh, at least the young people I know personally. No, that's a big one. Um, the fact that they're not getting out enough, they're not in actual sunlight or wind or fresh air, mm -hmm. and then the so much screen time. And another thing that I see is their uh, posture as um, something that's really struggling because they, it's just so far Yeah, the, the texting neck. <laughs> yeah. And even when they're gaming and all the kids that are on the computer for first during online school with the pandemic, but now there's just, um, it's just a habit. And uh, I'm also very concerned about kids not learning how to communicate in person and how to flirt, for example, or how to say no, or how to um, know when someone is trying to get their attention with just uh, you know, eye contact or the way their body's moving. I think that's missing. It's probably two years behind now with kids. But uh, mm -hmm. so go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, would, I would say definitely that uh, integrating the body into one's actions is uh, when I talk about a lack of play, that's certainly, it's, and I'm one can, can make it, the way is my book, um, breathing is also a huge part of uh, integrating into the body. But uh, breath is a different thing from um, following a uh, following a breathing script or um, 
using a particular yoga that one does the same way every time, which has a lot of benefits. But uh, when, we, when we breathe in a playful way, or when we play in an embodied way, I think that has huge benefits for, uh, for our well-being. To me, play is exploration. Um, it's the it's the bringing together. It's the it's the finding what uh, what makes us feel alive. And I think um, I think that play in uh, in an embodied way is it can be as simple as walking in nature, being uh, being in an unfamiliar environment. I think uh, adults when we travel. Um, when we go to an unfamiliar city and see unfamiliar sites, I think that that is a great way to practice embodied play. Um, for myself, when I when I study, for example, uh, when I study biohacking or um, home genetic engineering, uh, that's very much a, a playful thing. When we when we learn, um, as time we get into our environment, explore our environment, I would say that that's playing in an embodied way. I love that. Yes, um, I'm big into playing. When I had the kids here at home little, I ran a summer camp out of my house because we were doing so many things and so many of their friends were sitting at home. And so I was like, come on. And so I, I bought a van. <laughs> we just, I mean, we went everywhere. We did, I had a zoo pass and an aquarium pass and the children's museum and the natural history museum. And then I found so many good deals. Like you can go um, swimming for 25 cents for per person. And then you can get, um, we, we found free archery. We found free golf lessons. I just wow. took them all over the city and it was, it was really fun. Plus, if you go to some of the museums and you ask for a tour, they really do want to teach the kids. And I think getting our guys out there and letting them see and so that they can move. Uh, I agree with you. That's what I see as mm -hmm. one of the ways that's really good to play. I also love reading together. And I think that's something that's possibly missing in our society as much. I, I ask parents and some of them say they do and some of them don't. And it's, it's, it's always, a, you know, it's not um, a shocker, but the ones who do read to the kids, those kids then like to read. Mm. So I think that's interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was something, I mean, my family and I read to each other, I think right, uh, right until I left home. Um, we would just pick a book we all wanted to read in the evenings and one of us would read aloud until our voice got sore and then pass off the book. It's a, it's a great family activity. Oh, I, yeah, I've, I've never done it till my voice was sore, but um, we have, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Hey, well, this has been so fun and we're almost at our time. Is there anything else that you would like to just end with today? Uh, well, thank you for thank you for creating this space. Um, yes, I I really appreciate it, um, and I I look forward to uh, to seeing more of more of you. And uh, I did also want to mention that uh, I'm doing a I'm going to do a a piece of artwork promotional artwork, so a a particular abstract piece. Um, which I create while listening to podcasts or so do that while listening to one of yours. And there was a, uh, there was a charity you mentioned in our uh, pre-interview. Yes. That, New Mexico uh, dream center, New Mexico dream center. Yes. Yeah. So I, I look forward to, uh, I look forward to hopefully helping, uh, helping the New Mexico dream center with the, yes. uh, they help um, traffic uh, survivors survivors of the uh, of human trafficking they're amazing so wow That's i can't awesome. wait to see that that'd be great christopher thank you um, yeah. well i i want to know how um how long has your has your book been out by the way i hadn't asked that yet oh uh it's only been about a month now 
Um, oh my! Okay. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was really sudden. I actually I was still f trying to get it to format properly for Kindle Direct Publishing when I contacted you about it. So. Uh, <laughs> wow. Okay. So yeah, I was yeah, I was going to say new. new, but I realized that we had spoken a while back, and I wasn't sure how new. So that is pretty new. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I'll get that. And and there's a a picture of it that I will also add. Sometimes it doesn't allow me to add pictures, but we're about to change oh, okay. podcast hosts, and uh, the other one does. So, um, awesome. Hey, well, it's been great to have you. I'd love to you know, communicate again and have another podcast. Could we, are you willing to do that again? Absolutely. I'd love to come on again. I feel like we just scratched the surface of, uh, of wellness in, uh, in this strange world of ours. I agree. It's, um, um, the time always goes way quicker than I think. So, um, I will contact you, but thanks for being with us thanks and so I will be in touch. Wonderful. Wonderful. I really look forward to it. Thank you, Christopher. Thanks for joining us today for this interview with Christopher Henningsen. You can get his book from the link in the show notes. And if you have any questions at all, you can email me at ruth at ruthcummings.com. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to Your Body Advocate with Ruth Cummings. We're so glad you've joined us today and truly believe you can live a pain-free, passion-filled life. To connect with Ruth, work with Ruth, or to grab your free ebook, go to ruthcummings.com. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. Until next time, friends, be open, include the unincluded, think outside the box, and spread love and kindness one smile at a time.